Welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development's fourth installment in the Setting Your Price for Your Food Product series. My name is Jeff Fittick. I'm a Business Development Specialist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development's Food and Agri-Product Processing Branch. The earlier parts of the series are available on Manitoba's YouTube channel. Part one of the series demonstrates in detail how to determine your food product's cost of goods, wholesale selling prices for various channel partners, and retail selling price. Part two demonstrates how to use an automated costing and pricing tool that was developed by Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development and is freely available to you. Part three presented the strategy behind setting your prices, plus where and how to position your product in the minds of your customers. Now here we are in part four, where we're going to outline how to use price promotions to gain listings, incremental display space, and help drive your sales. Okay, in terms of the context of this discussion, we're gonna use price promotions to gain listings in a retail grocery store, um, to gain incremental display space, so end displays, off-shelf displays, again, in a retail grocery store, and to drive incremental sales in a retail grocery store. So our efforts in this case are actually directed at the management of the retail store rather than directly to the consumers. So as a result of our actions um, directed at the management of the store, these are intended to positively impact our relationship with that store's retail customers. So when selling your product to a grocery store, you don't have the opportunity to offer that store's customers a discount directly. You need to work with the grocery store uh, management. So you would offer the store a discount for some period of time, and then they would pass along a discount to their customers. And of course, by law, we are not allowed to tell a retailer what they are allowed to, to charge for our product. Um, all we can do is suggest, but if we know how much a retailer wants to make for profit margin, then we can work backwards and set our cost in a fashion such that they are going to uh, follow our suggested retail price. Um, in terms of a discount or a promotion, both you and the retailer are going to contribute to the total discount that the consumer receives. Um, you can get a small small discount, and the retailer is also willing to take a slightly lower gross profit margin to provide the store's customers with a price promo. So it's a shared effort. So here's how it works as a, as a simple example. Here you are at the top. Let's say your cost of goods is $1. You want to make a gross profit margin of 45%. So that means that if you took that $1, and this is a formula you learned in our first pricing workshop, you take $1 divided by one minus that target gross margin or 45, target is 45%, so you go one divided by 55% or 0.55, you get a calculated wholesale selling price of $1.82. So that gives you a gross profit per unit of 82 cents. So that's 182 minus the dollar. So then your wholesale selling price becomes the grocery store's wholesale cost. So the cost is 182. Most grocery stores want to make a gross profit margin of 35%. So that's a 35% as a function of the retail selling price. So we can figure out their retail selling price in the same fashion. We take their cost, 182, divided by one minus their gross profit margin target, which is 35%. So you get 182 divided by 0.65. That gives you a retail selling price of $2.79. So that would be their regular selling price. Now, let's say you were to, to lower your gross profit margin by five percentage points. So your cost of goods remains at $1. Your gross profit margin is now 40%. So that means that your wholesale selling price is going to drop to $167. So again, the calculation is the $1 divided by one minus that gross profit margin is $1 divided by 0.6, gives you a wholesale selling price of 167, or a gross profit of 67 cents. Now your 
selling price becomes the grocery store's wholesale cost. So that's 167. I've seen grocery stores, they'll go as low as 25, even 20%. Um, the only thing is though, is I'm not sure, it depends on how popular the item is and how how, how big it's gonna sell. Um, but it might be harder to get off shelf display space with a, with a lower profit margin. If you had a decent profit margin and a decent discount, I would think it'd be easier to get um, extra display space. Um, so let's say they drop their gross profit margin to 30%, then their retail selling price is going to be the 167 divided by one minus 30%, or 167 divided by 0.7, and their re new retail selling price on the promo is gonna be $2.39. So essentially you gave up 15 cents, so you went from 182 to 167, that's a 15 cent discount, but the consumer actually ended up with a 40 cent discount. That's how, how the power of both parties giving a discount um, gets a larger discount to the consumer. So like I mentioned, on a promo, a retailer will take a lower gross profit margin. Um, most dry grocery items, they're, like you say, they're gonna look for 35% margin on the selling price. Um, and, and that can go to, like you say, as low as 20%, 25% even. The thing is, is, is before you go and, and talk to any stores about actual promos, is first go and talk to them about what their needs are and ask them, what kind of margin do you need for this, for my item on a regular basis? You should hear 35. If they don't, are not willing to tell you, then you can say, well, I've heard it's 35, is that about right? And hopefully they'll, they'll acknowledge it. Um, conversely, you can also go and say um, on a promo, what kind of margin can can you work with or, or can you live on kind of thing? And they should hopefully share another number with you. Um, you could probably further and say, you know, what, what kind of margin would you need in order to justify an end display? Um, so that'd be on the end of aisle display or off shelf, which is like a pop-up display or something like that. I'll show you some photos in a minute. Um, you know, so again, ask those questions and uh, you could do it in the chain store. You can go to an independent grocery store and, and just ask those questions and learn some of this stuff for yourself so that you, you have a sense so that you go in more knowledgeable. Um, and I covered off everything else here through that discussion. All right, so how promotion drives incremental sales is when an item is on a promotion, every retailer will put a yellow feature price sign in front of them so it kind of identifies so even just on the on the regular shelf they'll put these um these yellow flash tags in front of the item to help make them pop from the rest of the items on the shelf and what you're going to have is as you do promos over time uh, you're going to see your sales ratcheting up so that the regular level of sales is consistently going to be higher than it previously was so here's a picture of a health and beauty aid or HABA section um, where we've got a couple, this is a Safeway store, so there's a couple um, yellow promo items here. And I think you can tell that they're effective just by the fact that the items that have a yellow promo are quite sold down and everything else is still looking pretty fresh. It doesn't look like there's been too much purchase activity on the rest of the section. Um, there's also a proximity effect too, wherein things that are close to the items that are in promo will um, also enjoy a bit of a sales lift as well, just by the fact that you're bringing the customer to that section. So they may, they'll see the flash, say, oh, I think I need that item, they'll go and they'll look at it and it's like, oh, maybe it's the wrong size or the wrong flavor or something. Um, and maybe there's an alternative that they prefer that is in the section. Now they've realized they need the item or want the item, so they may end up purchasing um, an adjacent item anyway. This is a pretty typical um, kind of sales outcome chart that you'll see over time when you're doing promotion activity. And I remember being at a Sobeys presentation and they showed pretty much the exact same chart and that, their chart was taken from actual sales data from um, vendors who have done promo activity with them. So what this illustrates is on the um, 
horizontal axis. This is the week number. So week, you know, so um, starting week, second week, third week, fourth week, etc. So we're covering a period up to 12 weeks here. The unit sales is along the vertical axis. So what we're saying here is that we were at eight units sales per week for three weeks. Then we did a promotion and we had a um, double uh, doubling of our sales during the promotion. So a two times lift. And then after the promotion, we went back down to regular price, but now we've got a sustained sales over the next three weeks of an increase in 20%. So now we're up we're from eight to 10 units per week. And then let's say we do another promo and because we've got a higher starting point, we do a two times lift. Now we are up to uh, 20 units sold on that promotion. And then once the promo is done, we've now gathered more, exposed ourselves to more customers who have purchased our product and now our regular weekly sales may be up, um, up to 12 units. So in each case, we had a plus 50% on the sale and then a plus 20% sustained afterwards. Plus 50% on the sale and a sustained plus 20%. So after 12 weeks, we've gone from eight units regular sales up to 12 or 13 units of regular sales. So that's quite a big increase in that one store for that one product. Now, the thing is, is there's different alternatives in terms of what activity you can do. So if you just did a promotion with a price reduction on the product's regular self shelf position, you'll, you'll do okay. And it depends where, where your product is. And unfortunately, a lot of times when you're starting out, you may end up on the top shelf of a section if you're actually lucky to be lined into the regular section for your category. Um, and, and, that, and that's okay. but um, you're better off to see if you can justify an end display or some sort of off-shelf impulse display that is going to get more exposure, there's going to be more traffic by those kind of displays because they're going to be in a higher traffic area just by the design of where, they, where the space is. And as a result, you're going to get more exposure, you're going to get a bigger lift on your sale. Now, further to that, and of course, this is this is off the table right now. But if you were to combine um, a sales promo with a in-store product demonstration, um, then you would have an even larger increase. And of course, for any time you're doing an in-store demonstration, you need to insist that you have an off-shelf or an end display in very near proximity to that uh, demo station, so that the customer can be directed immediately to where to sell it. Um, you really don't want to have to be directing someone down this aisle um, on this shelf, to, you know, in a certain position. People just aren't going to bother. That's uh, too much effort. Um, of course, during the pandemic, we the um, demos are off the table, so we'll have to kind of think of what what is the next way to demo our products in stores, and then uh, have the capacity to get back to doing that. So when I talk about off-shelf displays, what I'm talking about is something that is separated from the regular section of the product. So when you go up and down the aisles, that's the that's called the center store, and um, that that's typically where a grocery product is going to be merchandised. Now you can um, some, sometimes the store is going to have their own merchandiser units. And those are available for vendors to use. Like you ask permission, of course, and you schedule a time when you might have your product in there. And they might be for the purpose of cross merchandising uh, one item with another item. For instance, they might put peanut butter in with the bakery department to sell more peanut butter. Um, you know, and, and have those items where it's like where the customer sees, oh, peanut butter right by the bread. Oh, peanut butter and, and, and jelly sandwiches or whatever. And um, all the stuff is there to help them buy that bundle of goods to make that that meal. Um, all, another alternative too is you can also bring your own um, off-shelf display units. So it could be like a wire rack, um, you know, some sort of merchandiser like illustrated here. 
or it could be like a dump bin style um, where you can get all sorts of cool graphics on the sides. Um, just to note, the Vortman cookie display here is not actually full right from the floor up. It's, it's uh, what is called dummied up on the bottom. So there's actually only about, I think another two layers deep in this display here. So you don't wanna be losing any customers who have to reach too far into the bin and end up inside the bin. So these are different things. You can get them um, you know, printed at a local uh, print shop. And again, these are things where you would schedule it with um, a retail store in terms of um, when to put these in. And then of course we have the end displays. These go by different names. It could be just an end, it could be an end cap, it could be a bunk end. Um, the reason for the name bunk end is because these are bunk displays and it's a, at the end of the bunk. Or end dial, that's another name for it. All different names for the same thing. Now, essentially the importance, the reason I harp on this so much um, about the importance of these is because um, we do these grocery store tours and we can walk the store and we'll hit the, we'll, we'll come into the store, we'll hit the produce, the deli, the bakery, the meat shop, um, what else, dairy, um, around to the freezers, and essentially we can cover, we're covering about the 40% of the value of the entire sales of the store by just touching those perimeter departments. Now the perimeter departments, named because they're typically traditionally around the perimeter, the outside of the store, um, are, are fresh departments. So those are departments where customers may feel the need or desire to shop them multiple times per week. So we're in the center store, the grocery aisles, we may only shop once a week or maybe once every two weeks. Um, the perimeters are getting a lot more frequent visits. And really a, a customer could shop the perimeters, hit that 40% of business, and with all the off shelf and end cap display space that is available in stores nowadays, they could see these various impulse displays. So if they're walking along here and they see the frosted flakes, and the Quaker Oats um, cereal, um, you know, they could say, oh, that's right, I need that, and just grab that, and not even venture down the cereal aisle at all. They can satisfy their need for cereal just by pulling it off this end display. And of course, people, when customers see an end display, they make an assumption that that item is on sale. It may be, um, there may be yellow signs on it, and, and maybe it is in fact on sale and it's a really great deal. And the store chose to make a big display because it's going to sell through fast and there's not enough space on the regular shelf to sustain the, the kind of demand they think it's gonna have. Also though, there are times, many times, when the items on the end displays are not on sale. They may have a big sign, but it might be just a big white sign. So it's, you know, it's saying here's here's an important item, here's a big display of it, and can, you know customers can draw their own conclusions about the status of that item, whether it's on sale or not. But the point is, is that a customer will see that, and it'll then they'll go, oh right, I should get some of that, or oh that looks like a good deal, whether it is or not, and then grab the item. And again, they can do their they can accomplish their shopping trip without even venturing down the store aisles. So that's you know, one of the reasons why it's so important to get out of that regular aisle display. Another reason um, why it's important to get out of the aisle is just because when you're part of the section with all the other alternatives there, um, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of other wonderful alternatives for your customer to choose from. Maybe you're not gonna win that fight in there with all those other alternatives. Maybe someone, um, you know, someone's other, someone's product is better known, someone has a better deal if you're doing promos. So that's where it's another reason to get out of that busy section when you're doing a promo to try and draw some additional traffic and build your business in that fashion. So like I said, a promo is gonna help you get that extra display space. And let me say, that's always a justification is, is for, for, for why you should have a display. Um, stores, like I say, the stores are designed, like if you actually walk, if you walk a store 
Um, especially one of the newer Sobe stores, those have a layout such that they've actually broken the aisles, the grocery aisles and the center store in half. So now they, instead of having two end displays, they now have four. So you've got lots more end display space there. And if you look down what's called, uh, Walmart calls them the action aisles, it, it's the high traffic aisles that get you from the front end to the back of the store, typically where the dairy case is. Um, those are extra wide. And typically down the center of those aisles is gonna be filled with pallet displays. Those are specifically designed for exactly that purpose, is to have those all that space there to put in all these off-shelf pallet displays along there. Now the thing too is that um, there, there may be a perception or, or maybe if you've talked to a head office of a store, they may tell you that there's a significant cost in money, dollars, uh, to obtaining uh, on uh, end displays or off-shelf displays. I know from my own experience in the industry that um, I used to have tons of end displays constantly without paying a single penny. And my principal, um, who, who, whose product I was representing, never paid for them either. Um, it was simply obtained by asking, and I would typically um, make payment with a couple free, uh, free goods of product every so often. And just to maintain the goodwill associated with securing and maintaining that end display. So I'm kind of going through this list backwards, um, as you'll notice. So we're, we're getting to the top point, and that was to gain listings. So essentially, when um, you're introducing your product to a new store, in my opinion, it's a much more effective presentation if when you go to present, you've got two pieces of paper. You've got your, and yes, you want to do it in person, um, social distancing, of course, masks, of course. Um, but it's it's still kind of um, that's still the way things are done. Even with all the progress other things have made in terms of electronic delivery and that, the grocery industry still seems to be very much an interpersonal kind of industry. I guess we'll see how much it adapts with the pandemic. But as far as I know, it's still pretty interpersonal. We're in. You you need to make an appointment. You go and you meet with the store staff, uh, manager, assistant manager. And like I say, you'll have a sell sheet that details everything, all the great reasons why they need to list your product, um, all the pertinent information to enter it into their computer. So the descriptions, the pack size, the cost, the uh, UPCs. And with this, you should also have a second piece of paper, which is a promotion plan. And in my opinion, the promotion plan is very important to show um, your retailer to demonstrate that you um, are, are in it for the long haul, that you understand that it is your responsibility to make your product sell, to make your product successful in their store. The retailer is, is if they're good enough to give you a spot on the shelf, that is wonderful, but it's absolutely your responsibility alone to make sure that product moves off that shelf. And really, just their responsibility to you know to to fill it, um, to stock it, to, to order the, your product. But ultimately, in terms of the marketing efforts, um, that's all on you. And by having the promotion plan when you present, and even whether it's right or wrong or whatever, you put something down. You're putting some thoughts down, maybe for the next 12 weeks, in terms of how you plan to do some some in-store demos, how you plan to do some some um, sales, some in-store promotions, that sort of thing, just to get that product moving. And I think it helps gives you a lot more credibility than if you're just going to say, please list my product, and then they don't know if they're ever going to see you again. Now, in terms of gaining listings, of course, part of your competitive advantage is that you're local and that you will be able to outservice any products on the shelf that are not local. Um, so stuff that you know, from foreign jurisdictions, because um, really there there isn't a lot of store level representation going on anymore. So 
if you can offer that, that is definitely a competitive advantage in your favor. So that's another point too to make is, and again, that's where the, where the promos come in is that you're, you're intending to be um, working these stores and getting your product uh, into, the, into the faces of their customers. In terms of scheduling promotions, of course, there's um, there's going to be a lot of competitive competition for the peak times. Um, so not so much a, a consideration for just having a promo, um, but also in terms of securing off-shelf or, or end cap display space, because other um, other companies are going to want to do those same times as well. So think about times when people have money. So th they might be. Uh, pension checks, there might be your pension deposits, there might be uh, child tax uh, benefits. So those kind of things. My advice would be to talk to the store manager, staff, and get a sense as to when their busy weeks are going to occur, and um, you know, and, and see if about the chance of, of booking promos and off-shelf display space for those times. Really, the the stores are your best resource in terms of figuring out the details of these things and really they are quite happy to work with you and especially nowadays like with, with Safeway Sobeys they've got a wonderful gentleman who works right in this territory who um, works with new vendors uh, getting their, their products listed and selling into their stores in Manitoba um, he has colleagues in other provinces in Canada who are doing the same thing um, you know, so there's there's opportunity to uh, you know, transcend the, the borders and to get into their stores across the country. Now, in terms of making the plan and planning of, of promotions, um, you need to realize that grocers are real planners. They plan things very far in advance, uh, could be 12 to 16 weeks in advance. And for certain things, like where they have to pre-buy for certain seasonal things, it could be even further in terms of pre-ordering stock for big events like Thanksgiving, Christmas, or Easter. So um, especially if product needs to be manufactured. I used to order Christmas cake in June, I believe it was, and have to nail down what it was that I intended to sell um, come uh, it was for October receiving. So I guess it wasn't that far in advance. Um, so yeah, you don't necessarily have to plan it that far in advance, but you also want to be um, giving yourself some time um, in terms of just the preparation that you are going to need. Because if you want to be talking to a bunch of stores and coordinate them and having the same promo in, let's say, multiple outlets of the same banner, so let's say five different Safeway stores in the city, then you're going to need time to go and visit each store and communicate this to them. Now, of course, they unless they advise you that they would prefer an email or a phone call, um, in which case you can do that much more efficiently. But anyway, you need to allow the time to communicate the promo to the stores to get their buy-in. You're also going to need the time to make the product. So that's got to be factored in there somehow um, to make it, to package it, and then ultimately to deliver it to the stores at an appropriate time that works for them. So um, you, you want to build that into your into your promotion plan so that you don't have to be panicking and you're also going to want to probably build some incremental stock too just in case things do take off um, or if they clean out the stock ordered for the promo during the promo week and are going to need to restock immediately. You want to anticipate that as well. So that's another thing where you, you're going to want to want to plan for that as well in terms of your production of your product. So with that, you, you want to allow for a wholesale retail lag. And essentially what that is, is that's the, uh, the, the period of time when you are doing the preparation work, you're um, allowing for shipping, you're allowing for communications, and um, allowing for stores to set up things. And even just in terms of allowing um, the lead time to, to, to catch um, an opening in a store such that you can get in there and that all the spots aren't taken up by other vendors. 
So what you want to do when you're building your promotion plan is you actually kind of want to start from um, the future. So you want to you want to look at when when do I want my when do I want this store's customers to have a deal on my product. So you would look at those times and then based on how much lead time or how much of a, a wholesale retail gap you want to allow, you would then um, bring that time backwards in terms of when you would set up the wholesale purchasing period. One thing you want to do too is you don't want to be too predictable in terms of setting up a deal every four weeks, every five weeks. Consumers will pick up on that and if that happens to be when, when they're kind of using the product and when they need to restock, you're going to get into the into the trap and, and essentially teach them to never buy your product at regular price. You want to have it such that you you give them the occasional deal for incumbent or existing customers to have a deal to um, keep them on, on, on board and on track with using your product and also to gain new customers. But with those incumbent customers, you want to mix it up a little bit just so they don't get too complacent into thinking they can only buy this product on sale. Also too is um, you want to keep really good records. And if you've done any sort of selling at a farmer's market, I would hope that you'd be in the habit from there of keeping great records as to um, how well a product sold when it was at a certain price or when it was merchandised on a certain corner of your table, let's say, or if the weather was really good or the weather was cloudy or the weather was rainy or, or what have you, different things, different variables that can affect how well your product is going to sell. Um, so those are really great metrics to track so that, such that you have a, a better sense so that if you're setting up promos in the summer and even in the grocery store, you may have a sense that, well, maybe they'll sell a little bit better than if we're doing it um, during a, a traditionally difficult week for weather. So that's something. And also too, as part of your tracking is that you want to be communicating even casually. What I mean by that is you may not set up a formal meeting, but if you happen to see the store manager and assistant manager of a store that you're working with, um, it just in passing is, is to share with them how well your last promo did, how well the, the end display did that they gave you in terms of, you know, you sold 20 cases and you know, twice as much as last time or whatever, share those metrics with them because that reminds them and that affirms in their minds what a great decision they made, A, for listing you and your product in their store and B, for giving you a chance to do these promos and to have that off shelf for that end display space. Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna validate you um, getting that again the next time. And, and it's gonna keep growing your sales and you become more and more important to them because you, you become a, you know, a decent moving item. So like I say, very, very important to communicate with them. This is just an example of what I was referring to with the wholesale retail leg. So, Let's say you want to have four weeks between the time when the wholesale buyers purchase the product versus when the consumers are going to purchase. So like I said, you want to start with the consumer. So for the week beginning, and some stores do week beginning, and the week might begin on a Sunday, it might begin on a Monday. Um, I think, I suspect Safeways might actually start on Thursdays now, because I think that's when their flyer breaks. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of asking them and getting getting into their language and their timing, and you can set it up for for each banner accordingly. Um, so yeah, some use week beginning, others use week ending. So W slash E or W B for week beginning. Um, so in this example here, let's say you want the consumer to be purchasing the week beginning August 29th. That would mean that four weeks prior to that is the week beginning August 1st. So if you wanted to schedule a promotion that, that reached the consumer the week beginning August 29, that means that you need to have um, a, a discount purchasing period for the grocery store the week beginning August 1st. Now you may want to make that a couple weeks to allow the store to purchase on the discount in order to satisfy let's say either the week before 
and the week of or the week before and the week after a promotion because there can be a little bit of a carryover effect from a promotion and also too is if you're able to get an end display and maybe even if they're a little bit long um, after the promotion like you don't want to load them up too crazy with stock but if they happen to be a little bit long after the promotion and if they're not too anxious to, to convert the space over you may be able to keep that space for an extra period of time and maybe it's on regular price the week after or even the week before a promo um, it's extra exposure extra sales at a higher growth for them but mainly for you is it's that extra exposure during that period of time this is my idea of what a uh, finished uh, promotion page would look like and I'll just run through it quickly. I do have a resource for this, so if this is something of interest to you, I'm happy to share the resource with you. Um, previously, I've walked through how to fill in the form, but inside today, we, we're not going to teach you how to fill in a form. We're just going to show you the, uh, the top level um, thoughts on this. So we would start out with the uh, dark gray here is the part that pertains to the wholesaler or to the grocery store. So the wholesale purchasing week. So we got week beginning November 7, and it's got the regular price per case, discount per case. If there's a blank, there's no discount. So then the, the net case is gonna be the same as the regular. And then you go down the list here. So in this example, the week beginning November 14, we just, um, actually, you know, I'm doing it backwards here. Yeah, we'll look at the um, consumer side here. So the retail side is the light gray, so the selling week, so week beginning December 5th, there's no deal. So the suggested retail is the regular price and they're making their 35% gross margin. Um, the week beginning December 12th and the week beginning December 19th, it looks like we decided we'd like to do a promo during that time. So um, on the wholesale side, the week beginning November 14th and the week beginning November 21, we would offer the, the grocery store a discount per case of $3. So that takes the unit cost down from 388 to 364, and we're suggesting a, a feature retail price of 499. So that's a 27.3% gross margin, so that's, that's pretty good. And then we're also suggesting, um, hey, we'd like to do a demo on Friday and Saturday for three hours each day, can we get an end display for that? That's what that means, short, short way of com communicating that. And of course, you would you'd have a conversation with the store staff to firm up any, any plans. And of course, you'd go and find a spot where, where your demo station is gonna be, uh, determine who provides it. Uh, typically, you bring your own and all your equipment and stuff, and there's, there's rules for following for that. Um, and again, once we're able to do that again, hopefully. Um, and then the same thing for the following week. Um, off shelf or in display. So we're asking if we can you know, have that. And that's the thing, you gotta constantly be asking for those displays. There, don't, don't wait for them to suggest it. It's gotta be you asking, you proposing, and even going and looking at spots in the store that you think might be good potential for your product. And if it, you know, if it, it involves walking around the store with the store manager or system manager and pointing out those spots and having a discussion, you want to be prepared for that discussion. So walk the store before your meeting, identify these spots, and then you can go from um, your first alternative. And if that's a no, okay, no problem. I've got another idea. Let's look at this one. No, okay, no problem. Oh, there's another spot over here. How about that one? You know, you want to be having these answers ready to go and um, such that you can eventually get to a yes. So moving down the calendar here, we've got a... Um, Five week gap where there's no promos, just regular price, regular gross margin for the stores. And then the week beginning January 30th, we want to do another $4.99 promo, and which means the week beginning January 2, we're going to offer a $3 per case discount. <clears throat> now, one thing you can do too is on, um, on promos, you can suggest creative pricing, for instance. So let's say we were proposing the week beginning February 27th, doing a promo. And um, instead of the 499 traditional price, we're gonna do a two for 10 mix and match. So essentially it works out to five bucks a piece, but the, the two for the three for kind of pricing 
is, is really great because consumers have been taught over the years, I, I'd say mainly from the likes of the Real Canadian Superstore, to respond to those kind of pricing suggestions because they, they often think that they have to purchase the two or the three to get that great deal. And I think the thing too is that even if they know better, um, like I know better and I still buy the two or the three because it's like, well, there's two flavors, so I'll get one of each, or there's three flavors, I'll, I'll get one of each. Um, so you know, even though you may actually get each unit for $5 a piece, something about that suggestion is typically pretty favorable with us. And we'll typically go for it. So it, it, it's a great tool to use in terms of um, increasing your tonnage during a promo. Um, this pretty much reiterates what we just looked at in terms of asking for the displays. You make the pricing or margin suggestions. You can be as aggressive as you want to be. And really the worst someone will say is that's too low. Um, what does um, the, you know, this price look like for margin? Or what does this margin look like for a price? And, and be prepared, you know, take a calculator with you, be prepared to do the calculations right there. Um, I've done that frequently where I'll, I'll punch out a deal and say, here's, here's what your cost is, here's what your gross is, and, and boom, right there, they'll say, great, do it. So um, you want to be prepared to, to, um, to work with them right on the spot like that and, and adjust your, your promo plan uh, commensurate with what's available and what the store is willing and able to do for you. Um, I mentioned about the multiple pricing. It could be even numbers like two for 10, it could be two for 998, three for 999. Um, something that divides evenly is, is good, just in case you have someone who, who does, like a store who does wanna um, offer it on the each price to all customers. And of course, the length of promo is up to you. It's your promo, you can do what you want. So if you wanted to do something longer, then you can. Now, typically, um, a longer um, medium to deep discount, or I'm sorry, um, a medium to deep discount promo is typically done for a week um, because that's typically an, an, an adequate period of time to offer that size of discount. You can do something longer. It's called an MTR or manuf Manufacturer's Temporary Reduction, which is typically a very small discount and it's gonna be for a longer period of time. So typically about four weeks. Um, I was just shopping the cookie aisle. Um, I didn't buy any though, proud of that. Uh, but I had to look and um, there was a bunch of crispy uh, cookies there and they were only 10 cents off, but they all had the yellow tag and, and it was a longer term uh, kind of promotion. So that would be an example of an MTR where they're, they're featuring the item it gets, gets the tag, it gets your attention to that item away from the competition in that section. And it, it's not such a special deal that they, I, I saw anything on in displays or, or uh, off shelf displays, but it highlighted them in the section and probably did help with some, some incremental sales, just at least calling customers to their product and bringing attention to themselves like that. And that's another thing too with off shelf displays displays and, and, and displays is that consumers do make assumptions that the stuff on there is on special. And, um, and of course, it, 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 it's, it's a great suggestion in terms of impulse purchasers. I've had um, a few customer, or a few clients rather, um, ask me about couponing and say, oh, they're planning to do a coupon and um, you know, give people a, a deal off their next purchase or a deal off some other item. My advice to you is don't bother. Um, I've done a number of experiments, a number of um, um, promos in the past using coupons to the extent where we even had the ad pads or the coupon pads um, on the shelf directly in front of the product. And it was you know, pretty easy. It really wasn't asking much of the customer and it was for right now a discount on that product right on the shelf. And we were still only getting about a 2% redemption rate. So it, it's not even worth the cost because if you're printing the pads, you're deploying them, um, you're, and you're looking forward to big sales, big results from these, it's just not gonna happen. I'm, I've, I've seen from experience. 
we were even taping the coupons to the products and even then the redemption was terrible. Um, somehow the coupons would get torn off or fall off or, or whatever, put in pockets and just weren't making it through the front end. So it just somehow seems to be too much effort to ask of customers. So it's just simpler just to offer a straight discount. You'll get that nice yellow tag. It'll you know have the effect the, the week of and you can gain some latency on that, like I say, if you do some extra um, displays afterwards. Another promo I want to tell you about is one that um, I call an unpublished promo because what it is is it's something I used to use all the time and I would just communicate verbally with my customers. And um, it's, it's essentially what it is is it's a free case deal. So it's for the, it's for the grocer. So you would say um, for every five cases that you buy, you get one free. It could be regular price, could be on sale. Um, typically you do it when it's on regular price. And the idea is, is that it gets them a bigger discount per case, but it's not really costing any money because you're just, um, you, you're trading on the value of the product to them. And of course the value to the customer is the wholesale, is the landed wholesale um, cost of your product. Whereas the actual cost to you is just a fraction of that. So it, it's a great way to use your product to sell your product. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't undermine your pricing scheme because it's kind of viewed as separate and you're, you're not actually putting any pricing in print in terms of saying, here's what this works out to be and here's the kind of um, aggressive pricing that's gonna go with this it can be used to pay for um, extra display space. Um, it, 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 another, another happy thing that happens with this is you get them buying in that multiple. So you create the habit of them buying in fives and then you can check in with them and, and bring the, the free goods whenever you do your store visits and you know, mark them with a sticker or, or, a, or a note that says these are free. Bring them in the back receiving, of course, is normal. Um, and, it, it, it might kind of create a bit of an excess inventory situation so that, and again, I'm not trying to load them up, but they have always got stock on hand. They're never going to run out. And maybe it might help perpetuate some end displays. I certainly found that myself with my experience. My stores always had extra stock in the freezer and we typically had um, end displays that were perpetually running uh, in these stores. So it was a very effective tool. Just to show you what that looks like is, um, let's say your unit cost is $1.76 and you're packing your product in a case of 12. So your cost is $21.12 for a case of 12. And you're, you're wholesaling your product for $4.54. So that the wholesale cost to the customer, to the, the, the grocer, for a case is $54.48. So the value, um, is, is 2.6 times greater than the actual variable cost. So, you know, when, when, you, when you're giving away a case, you're really only giving away the cost of goods. And of course, that's gonna be your, your ingredients, your packaging, and your labor. So you're, you're covering off all those costs in terms of that cost, and, um, and, and it's creating this, this much larger value. Like I mentioned, um, it's a great way to pay your debts at store level. So your debts might include um, buying out product of a competitor to make room for yourself, um, you know, just in terms of, of gaining their, their space. And it'd be for, for some of the, the products that we talked about in um, part three, where we're, we're looking at um, getting our product on the shelf in a section. Maybe you're paying for an end display. Maybe there's um, some damaged product or some product that's past code date. Um, never, never paid out with money. You're, you're best off just um, let it accumulate until it gets to be about a case and then bring a case. So those are good ways to use that. In terms of the math, here's what that looks like. So back to the same example where let's say they're gonna buy five cases. The uh, cost, the wholesale cost per case is 54.48. So five of those works up to $272.40. Now by adding one free, you just divide that total by six. 
So that works out to now $45.40. That's the average cost for all six cases. So that works out to a $9.08 discount per case. Now what's interesting is that in the first workshop we did where we worked out our um, cost of goods and then we added an allowance for channel partners called inside monies, um, we ended up with quite um, a large figure and I think it was pretty close to, actually I think it was about a dollar twelve in this particular example, that we had extra padding when we were selling direct to store so that there was money budgeted for doing this kind of activity in there without um, really taking any money away from our gross profit margin of 45%. So, um, and like I say, in terms of how the retailer uses this, they may use it to reduce the price to consumers. Um, I had some independent stores where their um, landed price came in higher than, than we needed it to be to hit our target retail. So our target retail is $4.99, but their cost was higher because they're independent. They had a higher upcharge from their warehouse. Maybe they were remote, so there was more freight cost. So we would use this to help buy down their price so that then they could hit the 499 and not be outpriced. Um, Cause then, you know, anything above 49 and no, the 499, our product would not sell. So that was an, a, an effective tool in regulating that price back down. Or the store can just take the extra margin. That's their prerogative, it's their choice. Uh, I kind of mentioned this already, just in terms of where if they have the free goods, they've got this extra stock, um, and they've got an end display, they've got the space. And like I say a lot of the newer stores, they've got tons and tons of end display space, even for freezers, even for refrigeration. So um, having that extra stock may not be a bad thing in terms of them, you know, needing an item to fill a section, or even just saying it's a decent seller, we're making a decent margin. Let's just leave it in there. Another thing too that I and uh, that I like about this is just the fact that it, it creates a little bit of confusion about the wholesale price. Just in so far as um, you really don't want your customers to know your price better than you know your own prices, just for the sake of allowing you the flexibility to change your price as you need. Now that's not to say you just be helter skelter and change it whenever you feel like it, but um, you want to um, have the latitude to to change your price you know, like once a year when you do need to need it. Um, but it, it, it just helps um, such that people don't know uh, and aren't too familiar with what the price should be and telling you what your price should be. The other thing with the unpublished free goods offer is you can change it or you can abolish it at your discretion. If you decide you don't want to do it anymore, you feel like you're giving away too many free goods, um, then you can say, yeah, sorry, we had to cancel it, um, or you know, blame it on the boss, and you're the boss, they don't know that, but, uh, and, and you can also just change it too, maybe it's now one with one with six, or, or one with ten, or whatever, um, you can try different things, you don't have to be locked into any one thing, because there's nothing in print that says we're doing this forever, and, and um, it, it gives you that flexibility. Again, I mentioned about tracking, keeping the excellent records. You want to have this for information for each promo that you do so that you are informed for the next promo. And you can have a sense that we, if we sold 10 cases in the last one and we expect to you know, do a 50% lift on, or a two times lift on the next promo, we're going to need uh, 20 cases for the next promo and then we're expecting our um, sustained business is going to be 20% higher than the regular business after that. So then you're going to want to build that into your into your, your forecasting and make sure that the stores have adequate stock. Um, and if they're not prepared to take it all at once, well, I would suggest you build the stock and you have the stock available so that when they do need it, then you've got it and you can, you can bring it in a hurry. Um, and again, like I said, you want to communicate your success to your retailers so they're aware of how great you're doing and they're going to keep supporting you worthwhile to support. So there we go. That took a little bit longer than I had planned, but uh, I think I got a little bit more chatty. So um, are there any questions for us? I don't see any questions right now, Jeff. So you must have done a great okay. job. <laughs> <laughs>
Sure. Talk to my talk to yours off. So. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, this is going to be on the Manitoba YouTube channel, so um, you can catch us there as well as the other three um, episodes of this series. And I thank you. Okay. Thanks. Right on.